Uh, I would like to now introduce our next section for a discussion on women entrepreneurs and climate change. We have a stellar set of speakers. We have Shloka Nath, acting CEO of India Climate Collaborative and Public Policy Lead of Tata Trusts. We have Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Chief Sustainability Officer of Renew Power. We have Dennis Curry, Deputy Resident Representative UNDP, and Tom Kerr, Lead of Climate Change South Asia from the World Bank. Ajita, I will give this back to you to take forward the discussion. Thank you all. Thank you again, Urvashi. Um, it's my absolute privilege to moderate this panel discussion on exploring the business of climate through women entrepreneurs. Our panelists today are stalwarts in the realm of sustainability and sustainable development. And I'm sure all of you are looking forward to hear their perspectives. So in the past couple of years, especially in the COVID era, companies in India Inc. have been aggressively pushing their diversity agenda. In fact, a lot of the larger companies have done a relatively good job of being, building a diverse organization. However, what cannot be overlooked is the fact that the women's participation in the workforce is dismally low. The gap has further widened during the pandemic where more women have lost jobs than men. And bulk of this exodus has happened not in the larger corporates, but in MSMEs and in grassroots level businesses. Apart from diversity, the other topic that has received a lot of mind share is climate change. Calamities have become a way of life today and women ironically are the worst impacted each time a calamity strikes. And today's discussion would highlight how women who are the worst impacted by calamities caused by climate can actually make a positive impact by being part of businesses which make a positive impact on climate. So let me open this discussion by asking our panelists a very basic question. Do climate change and diversity and inclusion go hand in hand? Uh, Shloka, it'll be, it'll be nice if you could, uh, you know, we can start, if we could start this discussion with your thoughts. Thanks, Ajita, and um, hello, everyone. Thank you to the Intellect Cap team and Urvashi for inviting me to speak today. Um, and thank you, of course, for the, for the kind introduction, Ajita. It's an honor to be here with all of you. It's a great topic. Um, and actually, it reminds me of this series of photographs by P. Sainath, the, the journalist. Um, and his series is called Visible Work, Invisible Women. And it really exposes the tragedy of women's work. It's, you know, grueling labor, it's unpaid, it's chronically undervalued. Um, and the unequal place of women in society really defines that very adverse relationship between climate change and women. Because climate change, you know, we know is a crisis catalyst. Its uh, impacts actually take those underlying inequities that exist in society and they perpetuate a very gendered developmental set of outcomes in India. And it tears those further apart. It causes girls to drop out of school. It causes um, you know, uh, women to be least likely to survive natural disasters. It causes female family members to be left behind in steadily uninhabitable areas as males migrate. Um, and so what we're seeing really is that women receive the last and the least of everything that climate change touches whether it's natural resources, whether it's incomes, whether it's agency, whether it's welfare. And it's really interesting because here in India and in popular discourse, climate change and women are defined by two narratives. You have virtue and you have vulnerability. And in Hindu mythology and even in current day taxonomy, the female gender symbolizes the protectors of the earth. You know, it reminds us of the virtues of nature because of inherent gender-based vulnerability in countries like India. What happens instead is women's vulnerability actually becomes the primary focus of this conversation. But I think both narratives discount the role women play as climate actors. So, um, you know, across India, women are actually at the front lines of building community resilience. They're conserving natural resources. They're upgrading community infrastructure. They're rapidly mobilizing in times of crisis. We saw that over COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I can talk about this uh, today in, in the conversation, but we know many, many organizations working on the ground and their models are centered around improving women's access, involving them in decision making. So not only ensuring that they are agents in confronting climate change, but they're also working to improve their own 
roles in society so you know uh, in addition to that you know within the grassroots of course there is this tremendous movement but also in the boardroom vaishali is here um and she's a wonderful example um campaigning on our streets you know we see women shaping the future of the climate discourse whether it's sunita narain to rohini nilakani to vaishali to disha ravi to greta thunberg women are redefining the phrase women's work and that really is the work of building resilience of shifting systems of saving the people in our planet um so i really want to emphasize that point when we talk about diversity and inclusion in climate sure um uh, coming to you dennis uh what is your take do climate change and diversity and inclusion go hand in hand Well, that, thanks, Ajita, and it's a it's a real distinct pleasure to to join such esteemed panelists and, and to be with in the conversation today. Um, so, uh, from UNDP's perspective, I would say you know very much so. You know, the the climate change and diversity and inclusion really do go hand in hand. Um, uh, as as Shloka touched on, you know, climate change is it's an issue that affects everybody, but but the inequalities in society. I mean that not not everybody is affected in in the same way, and 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 the evidence shows that women, but also youth, indigenous peoples, local communities, people with disabilities, and 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 the poor more broadly, shoulder most of the burden of climate change, and that's that's a, a phenomenon that we see across all crises. Unfortunately, uh, they they tend to be the first affected, and very often the the last to, last to recover. Um. So you know, and, and the root of that. vulnerability lies in in the, you know various dimensions of 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 people's financial social socioeconomic status and their and their access to services and deci- decision making uh, decision making and and engagement in policy uh, in this space but you know i'd like to perhaps look at you know i guess in UNDP we like to f- think that we are in the in the business of seeking um solutions you know so I, i'd like to you know look at the look at it from the approach of of seeking opportunities um and and in your opening ajita you you touched on the issue of india's you know um extremely low labor female labor force participation rate and uh, and that is you know extremely low at around 19% and and actually tragically has been falling and that's low globally and it's low within the region as well and and low in, in comparison to other countries at similar stages of development and you know here to here we are we are here today to talk about women's entrepreneurs uh women entrepreneurs and their role in in tackling the climate crisis um and and we know that india has set its out very clear climate change targets you know mm-hmm. um, net zero by 2070 um you know 50% uh, of energy from non fossil fuels by 2030 and has also stepped forward in 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 leading internationally so for example the launch of the lifestyle mm-hmm. for environment initiative so you know i think if we if we put these things together we can actually see that there's an opportunity here and that that we have to be very wary of of false choices and and that's why i think you're you you've started on a very good question you know these are not things that oppose that are opposing each other um you know promoting diversity and inclusion and tackling the climate crisis um there are things that you know solutions to these things reinforce each other uh so we can look at the the untapped resource of women's economic productivity as an as an enabler for solutions in in the climate crisis um so we we've often talked about are we here a lot in climate discussions about threat multipliers and climate change itself as a threat multiplier to the to the to the types of crisis that we have experience of for a long time now be they natural disasters or even conflict and, and social social unrest but uh, but we can look at empowering women as a solution multiplier you know and, and something that can really help uh, and and not only help but actually is essential in in achieving these climate goals um so you know i think if there is a you know we're always wary of silver bullets in in development discussions but you know perhaps if there is one it's it's women's empowerment be that in economic spheres and political spheres and and, and in social social dimensions as well so you know i i really agree they go hand in hand and um and and we when we look at this issue we have to look at both directions you know so it's not one or the other but it's really you know applying women's empowerment to support climate change policy and climate action and also ensuring that climate action and policies um in turn support women's empowerment and, and integrate women's empowerment and, and diversity inclusion in in uh, in them and then i look forward to the discussion we can talk in a bit more detail about examples as as we go ahead so back to you ajita thanks okay.
Thank you. So how does one apply the gender lens to a business which is based on the principles of sustainability or to be more specific climate change? Um, Vaishali, it would be interesting to hear from you. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Ajita. And uh, good to meet everybody. And uh, thank you for choosing this uh, very apt and uh, I would say urgent topic for discussion today. Um, you know, I, my colleagues have articulated quite well um, the relevance of, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender and climate change and uh, what is the plight in India. I think Shloka very eloquently pointed out and uh, Dennis from a solutions point of view. And I think all that is great. Um, so on the input side, I think a lot is being done. We see a lot of commitment. I'm right now here in New York at the Climate Week. and there were quite a few conversations on women, women in technology, women in developing world and so on and so forth. So there's enough being discussed uh, on this topic, a lot being put on the table with respect to the plight of women and uh, the correlation with climate change and how it affects them a lot more. Not only in India, it's even everywhere in the world. I was in Sydney recently and um, there was talk about how these one in 100 year events are now becoming three such events uh, in a year, not 100 years. So clearly this is an issue. Clearly it's an applied, um, you know, of women is impacted. My view is that if women get, uh, if men get more engaged in a lot of these activities, which are solely done by women, we'll probably, it sounds not very nice, but we'll probably get them to share the negative impact of climate in a, in a more shared way, which is not happening. Um, and so um, perhaps there is, uh, uh, you know, I was just studying the policies and I'm all, always studying them because, you know, we want to work with the government to do more in India. And a lot is being done by the government. I mean, it'll be it'll be wrong to say. I mean, there are at least a dozen policies um, which are there to engage women. Um, you know, at the workplace, uh, women-related incentives in banks and the Mudra scheme and the web. There's so many platforms, but I'm not sure how much is being juiced of these. How much is being implemented? How much are we reporting around this? And so I think there is scope for us to do a lot more, perhaps some sort of a commission which takes stock against SDG 5 is something which would help us be more outcome oriented, result oriented to see what's the impact on the lives of women. We should perhaps think about something like that. If it does, if it already exists, perhaps more effectiveness there. I also feel that women and climate change are, it's almost an emergency. So we saw in India when we had um, the co-vaccine being developed, I was just in, uh, you know, with Suchitra recently, and you really need the government and the private sector to work hand in hand. I don't think people recognize that uh, the impact of um, uh, climate change on women's life is more severe than it is on their, um, you know, on education vis-a-vis -vis women or maternity or health related women. I think climate change is impacting women in a very critical way. And uh, we need to kind of treat it as an emergency between, uh, you know, the, in, uh, the international community, uh, the governments, the private sector and the civil societies. And perhaps we'll see the, Moodle, uh, the needle move then a little bit more than what we see now. Back to you, Ajita. Thank you. Uh, coming to you, Thomas, uh, how does one apply the gender lens to a business which is based on sustainable principles? Uh, it'll be interesting if you could give us a few examples, a few anecdotes of businesses, uh, you know, where the gender lens has been used very quite effectively. Thank you, Ajita, and thank you again as well. I echo the other panelists. It's great to hear these conversations and to be invited to this. I just got back from two weeks in Delhi and uh, um, I'm now back in Washington. So good evening to you all. Um, I think I want to pick up on a few points. I mean, the, uh, all the other speakers did a, a terrific job sort of laying out and stressing the impacts and the unequal impacts that climate has on women. Um, I think uh, I want to pick up on um, Shloka's point about vulnerability, though. I think one key thing that we really are, are don't have a full handle on, but we're trying to do a better job at the World Bank Group, is actually assess the, the impacts of these, you know, the new climate normal. Are these, as, as uh, Vaishali just said, these events are happening much more frequently and much more impactful and, and devastating than they were in the past. And we don't know 
the impact that has on the economic development pathways of countries. Countries are, you know, continue just to kind of fix from a shock and then go back to business as usual. They can't do that anymore. So I think, you know, you see a great example right now is as we speak, Hurricane Ian is about to hit Florida. You know, they're, they're ready for that. And I think, you know, probably when it's all said and done, it'll be devastating for Florida. We won't see that many deaths. You won't see that many, you know, the, the people impacted will be, you know, in a, in a bound area. Let's contrast that with Pakistan. The flood, the recent floods in Pakistan, I think the statistics were that 33 million people have been impacted, 1,500 people died, and I think um, more than 1.8 million houses were destroyed. Um, and then we even on the gender element that uh, 650 pregnant women were infected, in fact, including 73,000 that are expected to deliver this month. So um, that's the flooding in Pakistan, and that magnitude is just off the charts. I think as well, the heat uh, waves we saw this spring, and we, we continue to see are really unique to South Asia. Uh, and we aren't ready, especially for the impact that has on agricultural productivity and the livelihood of the female farmers. So you look at the, you know, they're the ones who are having to secure food, water, and, and fuel. And, you know, when a climate event like of this magnitude, these heat waves hit, you know, they are, they really are bearing the brunt of these impacts. And I think going to the point about the economic development pathway of these countries, the World Bank Group is in the middle of doing a new sort of climate diagnostic at a country level. We're calling it a country climate and development report. And we're trying to look at where country, the, all these countries in the region have aspirations to achieve middle income status. And that's re, that was realistic. But then saying you have to overlay the climate impacts you're expecting to face, you know, whether it's sea level rise and coastal impacts, whether it's the drought and the floods and, and the heat on agriculture, the urban infrastructure and so on. And we're trying to be very systematic and look at this. And I think one of the key things is first, the poor and the vulnerable, as, as other panelists have said, are definitely the brunt, bearing the brunt of these impacts. Uh, and then secondly, investing in resilience is paramount for the region. And so I'm, talk, I'm not just talking about infrastructure that so you can see and kick the tires of, you know, big roads and, and, and seawalls and things like that, which are quite expensive. I'm talking as well about the sort of soft infrastructure, you know, the social the protection safety nets and the education and the early warning systems and the community response when a disaster is hit. So we have to hit on all, all of these levels and it's going to have a price tag associated with it. And I think we really need to focus on this vulnerability and the resilience imperative for the region as far. The final point I'll make now, and then I do have some good examples um, on coastal resilience response, on forestry and on renewable energy that I'd like to talk about. But I think in this area, we, we there is an opportunity in decarbonization. I think resilience is by far the priority. But as you see these markets picking up, uh, and as you mentioned in the opening statements, these small and medium enterprises, there's a huge amount of innovation and 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 uh, um, business models that are being developed just unique to South Asia. I think women need to be part of that conversation even more than they are today. Um, and there are some, some terrific things we can do to kind of build the skill set and, and pivot them towards this sort of green opportunity. So, so there is this resilience imperative, but there are some opportunities in the transitions as well. Uh, so I'm happy to, again, to come back to some of the examples in the next round. Thank you. Thank you. So what are some of the priority issues related to gender and climate change? Uh, Dennis, um, you may like to come, you know, come share your thoughts on this. Thanks, Ajita. Um, I think, you know, that the, uh, you know, as we said, the, you know, other, other panelists have touched on, you know, we, we have to look at the climate crisis as something that's not gender neutral. You know, it doesn't, it affects uh, people differently based on the, not only their gender, but various other other indicators or other statuses. But, but you know, we do know that women and girls experience the greatest impacts of, of climate change and it amplifies existing gender inequalities and, and poses kind of a unique threat to, to, the, to various dimensions of, of, of their lives, livelihoods, health, health and safety. So, you know, some examples that we see around the world, you know, in terms of women, you know, the already um, pre-existing burdens on 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 women and girls um, disproportionately held by women and girls. Uh, things like walking longer to fetch fire water and firewood, um, and uh, you know what we see with, with the climate crisis is that you know with crises that exacerbate these issues, uh, they they impact disproportionately on, on women and girls. Um, so you know I think the the I, I touched on the the you know women's participation in the labour market and and you know we can continue to. To see that you know that women are a largely untapped resource, and and the 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 root causes of that, I guess we we need to explore and unpack a bit more. 
um, you know, whether that includes uh, biases uh, in terms of the perception of women's role in society, um, but also kind of fundamental issues and, and rights, such as restrictions on land rights, um, you know, their limited access to technology. And in particular, I think for this discussion, we might go a bit deeper into things like limited financial resources. Um, but in terms of, you know, the women's economic uh, role, uh, but also I think, you know, w women's access to decision making and, and engagement in decision making and engagement in policy. And I think that's really where, we, you know, as we go forward with with climate policy and climate action, we need to make sure that women are in the in the space, in the in the conversations as equal partners on that, um, not only be from, from a basic kind of starting point of, of 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 rights and engagement in that, but but because you know women are very often at the front line of, of these challenges and the 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 and are, are aware of the best innovations, the best policy responses to to uh, to mitigate these issues. Yeah. So uh, you know I think that really has to be a, a departing principle for us, if you like. Um, the you know other examples that come to mind you know uh, you know I touched on the start uh, when I spoke earlier about the potential you know in terms of women's engagement women's economic empowerment so you know and and there's a wealth of data for um, you know around the world in in, in, in countless studies on 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 that you know so for example um, in the agricultural sector you know women smallholders you know when we support this area um, support women in that space. You know, we see farm yields increasing by twenty or thirty percent. You know, and that then contributes to issues of food scarcity and 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 which is a core threat in in the climate crisis. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we we do need to get uh, more focused. I think on on looking at that, building the evidence base for for what are the issues that are on that are that are in, you know holding women's uh, economic empowerment, women's engagement in the economy back and, and then looking at that, at that particularly with, with the climate issues in mind. So perhaps I'll pause there and, and hand back Ajita at this point. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Vaishali, I was reading your article um, uh, on LinkedIn, wherein you talked about how you're training women working on salt pads. Um, you're giving them technical training. Um, so, you know, that kind of um, uh, makes me ask you this, the next question, which is on how do you see women entrepreneurs contributing to the climate dialogue? Um, you know, and what are some of the critical barriers they face? Yeah, I mean, I find this question, and thanks, Ajita, it's a great question, but this question is being asked so much, and I just feel like if you look at the data uh, which we have out there, where if you look at identical businesses, you know, same uh, age of the business, uh, similar sector, you know, women-led businesses are more profitable. It's a fact. And there's data out there. And, and I'm not sure. And so the big problem is that, and that combined with the fact, you know, when I was here at the Climate Week, there were some conversations with young women, and I was a part of that. Um, you know, if you see um, most of the, you know, the new trend is a lot of the young students who are boys are not wanting to go and get their MBA anymore, right? So there was this conversation about uh, we as women also perhaps may not want to, but you know, guess what? I want to start my own business. I want to start my own fund. But when my CV gets floated around without an MBA, as it is the chances of my getting, um, you know, funding is less, yeah. this is going to help me. So there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of... Um, uh, insecurity about women's position despite success. So uh, despite policies by the government and so on and so forth. So I think we just need to recognize that um, we just need to be more uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, women do as well, if not better. And so let's just step it up and support them. Um, and so um, your uh, your question was on the salt pan and uh, sorry, just remind me what what uh, what is what exactly did you want me to? I mean, it's a great program. It's a great climate um, you know centric program. Uh, it's sad to see how women who have uh, who are so confident and so and the only sort of if I could say bread earners in their families um, are just not get, getting paid or getting 
paid a very small amount and there is a lot of renewable energy related work which is being done in certain parts especially the northern and uh, northwestern part of india and we just felt that it was a great opportunity to reskill them and so we are running programs uh, in partnership with seva and we have uh, undp in fact shambi and i were in uh, um, you know in a local sort of home and went and lived with some of these women for a day and uh, we just reskilling them to become uh, solar technicians and though we don't usually promise employment but uh, we will do whatever we can to ensure that we connect the dots uh, without a commitment but the whole idea is to train women and it's amazing to see when we are in a panel like this sajita if you had one of those women uh, she would have probably outdone each of us with respect to the pointed comments on climate uh, change the impact on their lives first hand so they have crystal clarity the sad part is nobody engages them right and so nobody engages them we don't engage them international in fact i was also i i hate to keep saying but because i am in this forum where there were a lot of people there was um, you know there was the secretariat from uh, cop were there and i made the suggestion that there should be opportunities for these women to speak because they're so confident and they really have um, their fingers on uh, point with respect to the key issues and it's important for them to be heard um you know first hand um i think the problem is very simple we just need to be um you know we just need to ensure that we don't come in the way of women because if we do that they're just going to help us do better in this area because they really face the consequences of climate first hand so the solar technicians program is one of the uh, programs but we are running many other programs in urban india in partnership with the iits we are running a program where we are helping women entrepreneurs who are focusing on clean energy related projects to get funded to get mentorship and to advance their ideas we are mentoring many of them and you know they are do working on projects like solar uh, storage um you know circular economy waste management and very relevant issues so we're just going around fishing and trying to do our bit but i think we can all come together and just execution i think just just recognizing that there's huge amount of competency and um, you know ability to find solutions to problems because that's what women do all the time with limited resources find solutions pretty useful for running a business so yeah um back to you jita thank you so actually i was in karnataka recently reporting for a story so i met this woman farmer who grows millets uh, who grows ragi and um, she's taken up farming because uh, um, her husband decided to move to city in terms of, in search of livelihood so she, though she's there she finds it extremely difficult because she has no idea about policy she has no idea about msps she has no market linkage so she finds it extremely difficult to sell her products so um sell her produce so yeah so i can kind of relate to what you're saying um, so anyway now moving on to shloka um to you shloka so what are your perspectives in, on increasing women's leadership in you know women's participation in leadership and innovation in with respect to climate change business Thanks for Jeetan I think again you know just just sort of commending the perspectives that my fellow panelists have taken it's it's really one of the more sort of advanced and thoughtful discussions around gender that that I've had the good fortune to be part of um I think the discussion on vulnerable groups look it's been an important means of drawing attention to the very human dimensions of disasters and climate change something that we weren't talking about enough um but in operational terms you know labeling groups as vulnerable has also meant that they're perceived as passive recipients of external assistance with very little to contribute to solving problems which of course arise from disasters and from climate change so i think we have to be really careful around that terminology and you know we know that women in poor communities are amongst the most vulnerable to disasters and climate change um tens of thousands of organized women's groups live in impoverished rural urban forest communities um but they are as i mentioned earlier collectively acting to actually reduce the adverse effects of climate change and these women's groups are conserving natural resources they're shifting to adaptive farming techniques they're growing food crops they're upgrading community infrastructure they're literally pooling their savings to provide you know crisis credit 
uh, livelihood loans. They're collaborating with local governments to build more resilient communities. Um, and I think what's happening today, again, you know, with the advent of COVID-19, these organized groups and their, con- and their contributions are really being recognized by government. Um, they're formally actually appointing them as resource persons, whether they're trainers or information disseminators, they're monitors of government programs. And the um, COVID-19 crisis, I think, really demonstrated the kind of public leadership roles that women at the front lines of the crisis undertook. They were, you know, identifying beneficiaries of government social protection programs. We saw women educating communities on government entitlements, you know, like free rations. They were ensuring that people followed health protocols. They were negotiating for food um, from wealthy farmers to feed families in need. So if you talk to grassroots leaders, they actually attribute their capacities to respond to any crisis, no matter what to three things. This is what we've learned at the ICC. The first is that women are organized and they're able to rapidly mobilize towards collective action. The second is that small and flexible grants have actually been put in the hands of women's groups and that's allowed them to explore longer term solutions for resilience um, and for development. And, you know, that's also helped them actually provide easy access to sort of urgently needed resources during crises. So those small and flexible grants have been really important. The third is that women's groups have actually built very strong relationships with local governments, both elected as well as administrative. So these three strategies have actually been key to ensuring that women live who live in impoverished communities actually express the power that they already have. They don't need to be empowered. Women have power. They they can use that to withstand the worst impacts of climate change and disasters. And I really want to emphasize that, you know, very often um, when we, you know, within the climate community, I, I keep saying that we're guilty of being gatekeepers around climate, um, you know, knowledge. It's often, um, you know, a very technical exercise. And when we talk about resilience or building resilience, it, it can be seen as a very technical exercise, you know, providing information or or knowledge or training or technology that's aimed at improving, you know, the conditions around us. And of course, these improvements are urgently needed. But, you know, hand in hand with those technical solutions, we have to be informed by analysis of the underlying underlying power imbalances as well as the social, economic, and political processes that actually impede women's access to resources and power. So building women's leadership as managers of community resilience is really a political project. You know, it has to um, ensure, as I said, that those who are vulnerable, you know, are allowed to express their natural power. Um, You know, there are shifts in how we share that power. We need to seek to dismantle social and economic processes that actually constrain women's choices. And we have to really give voice to women in public decision making. And that means long term investments in which organized women groups and their networks actually collaborate with philanthropies, with government, with technology providers, so that we can explore and learn from a whole range of solutions as to how we can drive sort of more sustainable, more resilient um, development goals. And I'll close with just an example of, you know, one of the organizations that we work with. They're so inspiring. Um, They're called SSP, Swayam Shikshan Prayog. They're a women's community organization that works extensively in the Marathwada region of Maharashtra. And a severe drought caused, you know, mass migration of men to cities. And so SSP worked with local women groups to develop this women-led climate resilient farming model And in four years, SSP empowered women through training and key resilience practices. They provided them access to a low interest fund, um, as well as community level knowledge sharing. And this has led to a 25% increase in crop yield due to to diversification practices, 25% savings per crop per cycle on input costs as well as improve local water sources and increase household savings. And with women managing those household budgets, which have, of course, primarily focused on providing better lives for their children, these earnings have actually translated to better health, better education indicators for the entire area. So not only does that show the immense capacity of women to contribute to change, but also it's a clear demonstration of how climate intersects so closely with the other developmental indicators that we aspire to achieve. Interesting. Thank you, Shloka. Uh, Thomas, I would come back to you now. 
so South Asia is home to three of the top five countries in terms of vulnerability to climate change globally. Uh, these countries are attempting to tackle climate change, but they're also responsible for growing their economies parallelly, which is proving to be counterproductive. Um, so it'll be if it'll be nice if you could shed light on the challenges these countries are facing and the kind of strategies they have come up with. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to pick up on um, what, what Shloka just said about sort of community, uh, women's community groups and resilience, because I think so one of those countries that, that's a top three is Bangladesh. Uh, most people know Bangladesh is on the front lines of coastal storms. Um, but to get it to, you know, and, and what, what is actually see, we've seen, though, over the past 10, 15 years is a tremendous uh, success and turnaround rate in terms of reduced deaths and and displacement due to these storms. So one example was, I think, um, in 1970, there was Cyclone Bola that killed 300,000 people uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, a similar intensity storm, which was Cedar, uh, the cyclone in 2007 killed 3,500 people. And so you have the Netherlands now asking Bangladesh, what are you doing? You know, so it's a very interesting sort of lessons learned. And this is all documented very well. What my colleagues in uh, the DACA office just did a, a retrospective looking at the past 10 years of what Bangladesh has learned from building up this coastal resilience. But the, the gender angle here is really interesting. So anecdotally, the team had said, you know, we know women are almost uh, often always the last to seek shelter when storms are coming. Um, anecdotally, they knew that, but they weren't able to really pin down. So they started to, to collect the data. And in fact, for uh, the cyclone Bola, women died uh, related to men 14 times more likely than men to die. Um, and so, you know, that became a real rallying cry that this is this has to be something we have to fix and we have to be intentional. This soft infrastructure that we that, that Shulka was talking about, we knew it existed around women trying to build resilience, but we needed to kind of make that more formal. Uh, and so we came along with a uh, Bangladesh uh, cyclone preparedness program that's helped dramatically lower the death toll of women. So then as you go again to this cyclone cedar that I mentioned 2007, rather than 14 to one ratio of women to men dying, we had five to one. So we still have a, a big gap to bridge, but we were making, they're making progress. And I think it really came down to building these multi-purpose disaster shelters and strengthening the community uh, resilience in terms of the links that to the local government. And as I said, it's not all about hard infrastructure, it's about this soft infrastructure and building this much strongly. And I think that the great thing is that um, we have a thousand shelters across Bangladesh now, and they're multi-purpose. So they're using, they're using them for education, they're using them for community centers, they're using them for, um, they're designed for people with disabilities. You know, I think that it's a really, it's, it's become a kind of center for the community. And it's a real success story in terms of building resilience in Bangladesh. And if you wanna learn more about that, I encourage you to, to log into that report. I think then going from the sort of vulnerability and the sort of risk side to the opportunity, um, India, you know, I used to work at the International Energy Agency about 15 years ago, and I remember India was nowhere on the map in solar power. Today, it's the world's fifth largest solar power uh, market. Um, and it did that through a, a sort of an intentional set of carrots and sticks, federal responsibility, state responsibilities, public and private funding, and it's really built up the market. And this transition is really heavily underway. I think the lowest cost delivered solar power is in India now around the world. Uh, but I think in terms of women's involvement in that, I think it's growing, but I think we have to be more intentional about making it part, making them part of the transition. I still, I, we still see the sort of perception that green jobs in the energy field are, are male jobs. And, you know, somehow that has to be, uh, to, to that, you know, go away. So I think in terms of this not going automatically, I think we have a program called the We Power Program. And it partners with electric utilities and, it, and engineering bodies and other people in the space. And it has a system of sort of tracking women's advancement in, and hiring in the company over time. And it also helps with things like internships and job resources and making networking connections. And it has, I think, 31 partners uh, now across the region. Uh, and they're learning, kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning and things like that. And I think one just example or result I'll leave you with in Pakistan, uh, there was a, the Pakhtuncha Energy Development Organization signed up with us and the project seeks to raise um, the female staff from 2.6 to 15% on, in the first tranche, but then getting up to 30% over a longer period of time. 
So I think that's a good example of, you know, the women should be part of this re solar revolution, the, the energy revolution we're seeing and the transition we're seeing. But I think you have to be intentional and give these companies sort of these, these sort of milestones and, and metrics that and sort of, you know, we're watching you, we'd like to see you change and then also provide the infrastructure and sort of the networking to let them do that. Back to you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Over to you, uh, Dennis. Um, it'll be interesting to hear from you about what actions can we take uh, to better incorporate gender equality and women's empowerment into policies and programs around climate change? Hi, thanks, Achita. And, and, and I'll, yeah, I just want to circle back a little bit to a couple of points that made there. Yeah, so first one by Shali, you know, to totally agree with what, what you said. You know, you mentioned the, the you touched on the, the cooperation that Renew and, and the UNDP have, have, have worked on together on the Women Climate Champions. And, um, you know, so we, in that program, um, you know, we, we brought on a cohort of, you know, really exemplar, uh, you know, women, uh, engineers, chemists, you know, uh, at, at the forefront of, of innovation in this space. And, uh, and, and it's really clear that, you know, women, wh when given the space, when given the support, uh, things like mentoring, uh, you know, support in terms of business development, you know, the, the results are, 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 are amazing. You know, you mentioned, um, you touched on some of them, but, uh, but the examples include things like, uh, you know, they cover a wide range of topics I was reading earlier, like uh, you know, more efficient street lighting, you know, air and water purification, um, you know, recycling of materials into into uh, sustainable uh, products, you know, and uh, for for construction, for example, that meet all the the, the required um, you know standards in in in, um, in 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 that that India sets. So you know, I think the yeah, it, we, when we see that evidence of of, of when women are given the space, uh, the productivity and the and the, the models that can emerge, and uh, we really do have to ask you you know what, why we're not seeing more of it. Um, and Thomas, kind of you know, really to reinforce what you said around intentionality, um, completely agree. You know, we can't admit, and to point to one example internally from the the UN. Um, uh, Vaishali, you mentioned Shambi, who is the resident coordinator of the UN in India. So um, every country that the UN works in has has a we operate under the coordination of that post, and and uh, we're very proud to say that uh, globally that's at fifty fifty now, uh, male female. You know, and those that didn't come around by accident at all. You know, it's very much proactive uh, policies around tr these kind of similar measures to track women uh, as they are hired as they progress. Uh, through through an organization and i think you know businesses do need to um to to take that you know, be more intentional i think you, you framed it very well thomas um, but also there's a role for for government there in terms of setting the policy framework that kind of supports that that yeah. evolution i think some other thoughts in terms of policy framework you know we we have good examples around the both you know within india and um and and, and regionally and globally that UNDP has has been engaged in 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 um in supporting women women's economic empowerment and women's entrepreneurs um and you know there there are really many many examples out there I think the challenge is around what you touched on or your question Ajita around how to engage in the policy space you know I think we we have we do have um good uh, good examples of 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 engagement there you know regionally we have a climate finance network um that that works in thirteen countries that really seeks to to engage uh, women's groups um, in in that uh, in that policy space, if you like, promoting gender equality um, and and engaging in questions around sustainable finance for, for this kind of work. Um, I mean, budgeting is a key area, I think, to narrow in on. Um, in Indonesia, as an example, um, there's a, a gender budget statement that that now sectoral ministries um, uh, you know submit uh, yearly, and that um, enables kind of climate. Budget, the, but that is tagged and and analysed with, with gender dimensions. Um, in in Bangladesh, there's a, a climate change fiscal framework and social audit uh, mechanism, and that's an area that UNDP has also supported. Um, uh, where where again um, we are you know, form, for supporting the, the formulation of policy frameworks that that engage on gender issues. Um, a final example uh, might be for in Thailand. We had um, uh, you know, we've we've engaged in supporting um, climate change cost benefit analysis uh, with gender and social inclusion. So again, getting into budgets, getting into the um, the, the nuts and bolts of of of, of policy and, and applying gender gender um, analysis there. Um, so so perhaps I'll pause there. Yeah, uh, in 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 terms of yeah 
you know, covering policy, if you like, that, that challenge of, of, um, of, of engaging uh, gender equality mechanisms in, in policy. So back to you, Ajita. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, my next question is on the philanthropy. Uh, and Shiloka, I would like you to come in here. Uh, so I recently put together a story on um, philanthropy and it was heartening to see um, Indian, the new age philanthropists especially, uh, looking beyond traditional sectors like education and healthcare. Uh, I saw a lot of conversations happening around uh, uh, you know, sustainability, like creating livelihoods and climate change. And so, so, so that's why, I mean, that, that's the reason I want to hear from you as to what role can domestic philanthropy play in supporting local innovations towards climate change? No, thanks for that question. And it's climate impact. Uh, no, thank you, Ajita. And, and I think, look, what we know is, you know, the solutions we need are all in front of us. But to enable them, we know that we need a lot of capital. Um, you know, when we talk about climate change, it really is fundamentally transforming the systems we live in radically. So changing the world as we know it. And um, we also know, for instance, that India requires 10 trillion USD to achieve carbon neutrality by 2070. But that, of course, doesn't actually account for the costs of adapting to climate change. Um, and while grant capital may seem like a drop in the ocean when compared to, you know, what public or private capital can sort of put towards this amount, it's actually a very powerful tool in accelerating change. Because grant capital or philanthropic capital can actually go to places where other pools of funding can't reach. Um, so it has, I like to say that it's inherently compassionate. It, it you know, has tremendous flexibility. It takes on a long-term horizon. And so philanthropic philanthropy can actually be essential in supporting climate initiatives um, and of course in supporting local innovations as well. So um, I think in that way philanthropic capital is actually a conduit. It enables other sources of finance to enter the climate sector. It can solve for gaps and bottlenecks where other funds can't go and that can enable as I said other sources of money to flow into the sector. And climate change is deeply tied to India's vast nonprofit or civil society sector. You know, you're looking at premier think tanks that advise government policy to, of course, smaller grassroots organizations that are working to build resilience on the ground. And we've spoken about a few of those today. So we do need funding that allows us to develop our climate movement in a way that is very context specific, that's ground up and obviously true to our developmental needs here in India. So we need funders who similarly can set an India first mandate. And there's no one better place to do that than in Indian philanthropy. And we're seeing now philanthropic engagement with climate in India. It's, it's on the rise. That's actually what we do with the ICC. We look to mobilize um, funding and engagement around uh, climate action here in India. Um, we're seeing a lot of new players entering the space, um, you know, technology sector unicorns who are keen on investing in climate action, especially in those spaces where it intersects with technology. We're seeing a new generation of funders um, who are starting to engage with climate. They see it as a climate first issue, not a yeah. developmental issue with a climate lens. Um, and of course, Indian businesses are starting to engage more and more with sustainability. So we do have the highest number of corporates in this country committed to science-based targets out of all of the emerging economies. We're seeing a trend in CSR expenditure on environment increasing as well. Of course, that doesn't equate to climate action, but it does denote a shift in the ecosystem. And that's a big positive. In terms of supporting local innovations um, towards climate impact, I think the risks around climate in India are myriad, um, and of course, so are its solutions. And local communities, again, are often at the front lines of addressing those climate impacts. Um, again, their role in preserving natural ecosystems, protecting resources um, that they depend on is, is really vital. Um, and grassroots organizations and foundations that work with these communities, they often struggle to manage these impacts in their projects. And again, domestic philanthropy plays a very important role to um, build capacity for these communities and organizations to actually sustainably manage local resources and enhance their own resilience against climate risks, um, while, of course, improving development outcomes at the same time. And so there are a number of sort of examples of these where we're seeing domestic donors providing support 
um, to build that resilience around vulnerable populations. Um, and I think finally, just to sort of close, you know, I think philanthropy, domestic philanthropists are actually uniquely equipped to support the adoption of both technological as well as natural climate solutions. Um, there's a higher tolerance for investment risks and losses um, than for-profit oriented investors. Um, and so actually their best play is to provide really the early stage funding that emerging climate solutions need to achieve scale. And as these solutions are also applied on a greater scale, they become less costly. So eventually they can become more economical than less climate friendly options. And that's happened with solar power. We've seen that a relatively modest amount was spent on solar deployments, you know, through the 2000s. And these early projects were very important for funding improvements in technology and performance, um, and they ensured efficiency increases. And that really helped establish supply chains and capabilities for project developers. So, you know, in that way, domestic philanthropy can really enable funding and ambition to flow towards critical gaps and opportunities in the climate ecosystem. And so this support not only protects communities from the worst impacts of climate, but also paves the way for domestic donors to be real climate leaders for and from the global south. Thank you, Shloka. Uh, Vaishali, coming to you, it'll be interesting to hear from you. How do you think uh, you know, building a business through the climate lens would help um, in creating businesses for the perpetuity, businesses that would last uh, for the test of time? <clears throat> I guess that's what we're trying to do here. And uh, perhaps, um, um, you know, uh, just to come back to the point Thomas made, you know, when we started uh, our business, uh, the cost of conventional, you know, electricity through uh, was, was multiple times of um, renewables. And uh, now as we speak, it is, it is uh, way cheaper. And um, I think that is uh, an uh, example of what happens when uh, you have uh, policymakers uh, driving, uh, I guess, agendas, uh, investors stepping up, and the private sector coming together. Um, sometimes just to build a, you know, a viable business model, but you know, um, uh, which also has impact. And uh, you see a sea change in what can be created, whether for immediate impact or perpetuity. But, you know, that's how things work. And we're seeing that uh, in the area of climate change, um, um, you know, there is a lot of interest. It's at the heart of, I think, what fund investors want to do. It's the heart of what uh, government leaders want to do. And um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward if... Uh, all of us come together to drive this, just talking about, uh, you know, also funding. Shloka talked about local funding to, you know, fill some of these gaps. I think if we have the global funding, which is being committed to Global South, and if we were to see that coming through, as was agreed in, um, you know, uh, the Paris uh, COP, uh, I think we'll, we'll really accelerate uh, a lot of what can be done in Global South. I think uh, we as corporates are doing our bit, uh, to have an impact, uh, it, it makes business sense as well. It makes social sense. It makes environmental sense. And, um, you know, especially with carbon credits and all sorts of new areas coming up, there's a huge opportunity for, um, you know, people in the rural areas to get involved. And especially so for women to get involved. We are working on many projects around, um, you know, cook stoves, which has less carbon sort of, uh, um, um, uh, you know, impact and um, how how women can get involved you know they're the ones who will help us sell these cook stoves they're the ones who will help use them they're the ones who will propagate the health benefits of it and they can make money while they do this so i think anything which succeeds uh, continues and um, and 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 we've seen that uh, um, you know uh, this space which is uh, you know the renewable space and you know um, this whole area of sustainability is not only good for the planet, but people are really doing well as far as the economic outcome is concerned. And uh, just like climate, as in India, our prime minister prioritized, um, you know, uh, taking India from 100 plus to 500 gigawatt targets uh, have been set and we're assessing them year on year. year. We must uh, use programs like uh, what Thomas talked about, uh, tools which can help us prioritize engaging women in this transition 
because it's critical. We'll do better. We will do it in an accelerated way. So how do we come together and share some of these uh, technology inputs, financing, as I talked about, uh, you know, we really need, uh, you know, uh, funds coming in uh, from the outside. I see a lot of them being spent globally, but it's time to get them back to areas where we can really have on the ground impact. And uh, I think everything is in place. It's never been. Sometimes we always talk about the future, how we can do this and that. But I'd like to take a moment and say where we are right now is an incredible moment in time where all the stakeholders believe in the common goal for us to do better for the next generation. And now is the time. So let's acknowledge it and let's take stock. Let's just measure what we are doing, feel good about it and do more. So I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll create a lot of uh, good businesses which are more inclusive and diverse. I'm, I'm very confident about that. Back to you, Ajita. Thank you, Vishali. Uh, now it's time for your closing thoughts. Um, so I would like to hear from each one of you. What are the three things you would like to see uh, with respect to gender and climate investment becoming a reality? Um, Thomas, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you. This has been really a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Really, really great comments by everybody. Um, I think I'll come back to my first point, which I said before, which is intentionality. I think we do need to just be more focused on, you know, we hear these anecdotes about women being impacted more or less or women having more, having less, more of a hill to climb to get into some of these sectors. But I think we need to be more intentional about benchmarking exactly where we are. And then using really good data um, on the ground to kind of verify and then and then set metrics and track. I think that's all, that's the only way we're going to make change. And I think we've seen that happen when we do it. Um, and so, as I said before, the World Bank is at, at work doing these climate change diagnostics country by country. We have Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan coming up very soon. Uh, Nepal is already out, and then India is underway. Um, I encourage you to use the, you know, we were talking about, you know, entrepreneurs and, and philanthropic efforts. You know, they all need to go, you know, whenever you go, you need to set your baseline. You need to show where you are and then what your plans are to grow. And I think this, these, these diagnostics hope will help with that. I think secondly, um, you know, as we're seeing, you know, we talked about renewables, we talked about agriculture, I talked about coastal resilience, you know, these are areas where women were getting involved in, and they really came up with excellent solutions, and we need to scale those up. I think there are other sectors, though, that we don't, you know, don't necessarily naturally, you know, I think we need to look at what those, you know, there's, there's obvious barriers like, um, you know, lack of credits or, you know, land title, but then I think you need to find what are the hidden barriers in these sectors. So example is we worked in Nepal on community forestry, the, the country's trying to reforest a lot of the country. Um, they want to develop timber and non-timber products. And so, you know, what are the roles for women? We looked at like ecotourism, we looked at other sorts of training. You know, we have to think about those sort of hidden barriers that why they aren't entering into some of these new opportunities as well. And I think the final point is you've already talked, touched on it is the finance. I think um, Vaishali is right. I, I went to India for the past two weeks and I've never heard the mood music be so positive around the transitions that are and the opportunities, especially in the climate space and the green space with the carbon markets coming uh, and all of that. But, but it, you know, the, 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 there's still a huge amount of finance that's needed. I think what's needed is to more systematically look like solar may not need you know, huge grants and subsidies. It may, maybe you need to look more at what the what the those barriers are to get to market. Um, but some of the other technologies, as you get into like you know green hydrogen and some of these really advanced solutions, that you know what's the role of women in that, and how do we you know those might need more government funding. And so we have to be creative about the financing. But I think if you can bring together the the data, uh, these sorts of address, find the barriers, and then then I think then the finance will flow much easier. And the World Bank is really happy to work with uh, entrepreneurs and um, and a lot of these folks that are trying to find a solution on the ground because then we can shine a light on it and hopefully get it replicated throughout the region. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so, Dennis, what are the three things that you would like to see with respect to uh, climate investment becoming a reality? Uh, thanks, Sajita. Perhaps I, I was going to narrow in a little bit or go a bit deeper on financing. So I, I really agree with what Tom's, Thomas covered. Um, and, and again, I guess to, to go beyond the, the fact of the amounts that, that are needed and to, to, so my comments would be a little bit on how and, and, and where uh, we, we focus. Um, and so my first would, first point would be just to reinforce the need to invest in, in climate focused businesses that are, you know, pr that are majority owned by women, led by women and, and have, you know, a significant focus on, on, 
on, on women. You know, as we touched on in the discussion, the evidence is there. You know, we have more than enough evidence to to um, to to highlight both the effectiveness of women's women led businesses, uh, but also the 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 immense potential that lies untapped in in, in that space. Um, Secondly, there I think in terms of when I say a, you know where we would be talking about there you know climate focused funds and, and you know improving gender considerations and how those funds how the funding flows I think is a an area for uh, for for exploitation or, or improvement you know so in, improving how how you know investors look at, at at funding flows bringing gender into due diligence processes you know asking businesses how their business model impacts women how their products and services are going to impact the lives of women and girls and, and you know bring it touching back on our points that the women and girls will be uh, disproportionately affected by the effects of the climate crisis and then finally just to you know to focus in on the what the products of that we were speaking that we can speak about here you know so ensuring that we have gender sensitive sustainable financial instruments you know uh, gender focused funds making sure that analysis for gender is there and across funds and impact bonds and, and the kind of instruments that are being applied in this space. So uh, so those would be my closing thoughts. So thank you again, Ajita. Thank you, Dennis. Shloka, coming to you now. Thank you. I think, you know, both Thomas and, and Dennis have summed it up sort of brilliantly. So I'll keep mine really simple. I think just to sort of, you know, drum in what I was saying earlier, um, I think it's critical to emphasize the agency, the power and the transformation that we need to see for women at all levels to engage with the climate crisis, not because they're vulnerable, but because they're powerful and they have the capacity to create real change. Great. Thank you. Vishali, what are the three things on your wish list? All right. So I'll say I endorse what each of my co-panelists have so eloquently put forward. Uh, but, um, but just to kind of uh, sum it up, I think uh, leadership focus, political, uh, corporate, uh, and uh, investor-driven, um, I think uh, um, a drive would definitely help uh, get women on top of the agenda. Um, you know, um, capacity building and recognizing that there are women out there. When I'm sitting in conversations, not so much at Renew, but in other organ in other you know discussions like this, perhaps, but not this one in particular. People always say, "Oh, there's no manpower in the sector," and I'm like, "Well, then just let's go." You know what I'm going to say, Ajita? Let's go to the women power, <laughs> which is sitting there. And honestly, when we started, it wasn't like we had a whole lot of trained people. It was a brand new sector, and uh, men picked up. And, uh, you know, we all know women end up doing much better in school, at least in India, when we see all those newspapers with the 12th grade results, we have women do way better than men. Pardon uh, Thomas and Dennis for my and the other men who are here, but that's often the case. So there are a lot of women who can be, um, you know, engaged in the sector. I don't think we're doing enough. Let's look at and the sector is very dynamic. It's changing. So continuous capacity building and engaging women. And last but not the least, two things, legal and finance. We need laws which are fairer for women. It really crushes the confidence of women when they come in a playing field as competitive, but then they lose out because of the archaic uh, legal framework we have to work within. And funding. Fund. Uh, so when investors ask and demand the DNI ratios, companies um, ensure that they have women. Sometimes it's tokenism, sometimes it's not, but at least we are moving the needle. Funding many more funds uh, for uh, women driven ventures, I think will fill and bridge the gap. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, perhaps uh, these are some of the things which I think will definitely make a difference, but I'd like to conclude on a positive note that it's never been a better time to be a woman and just one more point I wanted to make even this change in the mindsets the social mindsets you know how the family and organizations look at women and the kind of support they extend and don't necessarily look at women engagement and and policies which favor women as oh now we are getting a little less and women are getting we hear that a lot when we have these discussions so let's be open-minded and let's have that all embracing mindset to do better together back to you Ajita. Wow. wonderful so climate change and diversity and inclusion indeed go hand in hand and our panelists have kind of said it in as many words. Uh, it was wonderful talking to all of you. And 
I'm going back rich with insights. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Urvashi, for this opportunity. Uh, I really enjoyed moderating this discussion. And over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to this entire panel. Uh, it's uh, late in the evening here in India, but I can definitely say we are really inspired and this gives us renewed energy to work in this space. Uh, we actually have quite a few audio, uh, questions from the audience and a few raised hands. Uh, we haven't had time to take it, uh, but hopefully we can convene this discussion at a later time. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody at the final day of Sankar tomorrow and hope to host you all in person next year. Good night and thank you again for joining us.